First of all, we wanted this to be a uh, gathering for our local medical community to meet and have a fun. And we thought it was a priority to try to have spouses come. So very few programs now can do that. So um, that was one of our goals. It seems like everybody's been enjoying that. So that's cool. Second thing, the second goal was we wanted to thank everybody who's here for the support of our practice. It really means a lot to us, um, all the uh, patients that you guys have sent us over the years and the relationship that we've developed with you. And uh, we want to say a big thank you for that. Uh, third of all, um, another goal is to eat healthy. So that's going to be one of the focuses of our one of our talks. Um, so you might notice that um, we've got a lot of protein, a lot of veggies on the menu, and we're going to start to have some special stuff in the back that has to do with our new ideal protein diet. So eating healthy is our third goal. Our fourth goal is to educate um, everyone here about four uh, new services. Uh, new offerings that we have that we wanted to kind of get the word out about. And then our fifth goal is to keep it quick. So we're going to have four lectures, but we want to keep them about eight to ten minutes. Um, and everybody sort of rehearse their lectures, and everybody sort of on their rehearsal run is within range. So we don't want this to go on and on and on. And um, uh, so in keeping that in mind, um, what we're going to do is we're going to ask for people to ask questions when the whole program is over. So uh, Francesca is going to go in one corner of the room, I'm going to go in another corner of the room, Fred's going to go in another corner of the room, and Mark is going to go in another corner. So if you have questions about the topics that we're talking about, just come and talk to us individually. We'll be very happy to, um, to go over some of your questions and answers in detail. Um, a couple housekeeping measures, if you guys wouldn't mind turning your cell phones to vibrate, that would be great. I want to thank the uh, folks from the Sun and Inn, um, Amanda Boykoffer, um, who's been so helpful putting this together. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Chef Ray did a great job. Ray uh, was very flexible with some of the menu requests that we have. and appreciate that, Ray. And also, Curtis Bloom, the banquet manager, um, uh, couldn't have been more helpful. So thanks, guys. Um, also, uh, please note that uh, every table has a centerpiece, and um, those are going to be taken home by someone at your table. And that person is going to be identified, the person who gets a centerpiece, um, as the person who has an SWGI sticker under their saucer. So you guys might want to take a look under your saucer. You got an SWGI sticker that centerpiece. Um, and I don't know if any of you guys uh, have been following this 
uh, ice bucket challenge yeah. that's been going on for um, ALS and a great cause. And I wanted to show you guys a couple of videos uh, in regards to that. So what happened with that is Walt Lizza, who a lot of you guys probably know, the owner of the Care Pharmacy, put a challenge on to our endoscopy center uh, last week uh, to do the ice bucket challenge. So uh, we followed through with that, and um, there were about 15 of us that did it. I'll show you that video, and you can see Dr. Calvary is getting soaked. And, uh, and, uh, and then we, we subsequently challenged our practice. Um, so the endoscopy center we challenged the practice. They're going to do it tomorrow. We challenged the United Bank. They're going to do it tomorrow. We challenged my daughter Olivia's ice hockey team. So my daughter Olivia's hockey team did their challenge a couple days later and did it in a very creative manner. So I have a video of that too. So you'll, so the videos number one is going to be the endoscopy center, and then number two is Olivia's hockey team doing this challenge. So here we go. Wow. <laughs> So here, here's the hockey team. They're at an ice rink in Pittsburgh, and they're sitting underneath of the Zamboni. Problems really arise when 
internal hemorrhoids and prolapse. So that's, that's the, one of the key points to remember about my talk, is prolapse is what really causes the problems. That when the muscularis submucosa becomes fibrotic, the fibrotic fibers then break down, that allows for slippage and prolapse, and it's the prolapse that causes problems with the hemorrhoids. Um, and interestingly, about 20% of people that have problems with internal hemorrhoids have fissures. So what are the typical symptoms of hemorrhoids? Itching uh, due to mucus uh, that gets uh, put on the perineal skin as a result of the prolapse. Bleeding that occurs as a result of tissue friability from the prolapse. Swelling when internal hemorrhoids prolapse and, and, and extend into external hemorrhoids, a so-called mixed pattern. And then, of course, the sensation of prolapse which can be very uncomfortable. And a lot of these people also have soilage. I have to apologize for talking about this topic while you're eating. You've got to remember this is a GI talk, so we can go anywhere we Okay, so when you think about hemorrhoids, you want to put them on grades. So they go from grades one to four. <coughs> the extent of the grade really has to do with how much uh, prolapse is occurring. Grade one, no prolapse. Grade two, prolapse, just with defecation that goes back spontaneously. Grade three, prolapse occurs, but it's uh, manually reduced, you can't be put back in there. And grade four being the worst, which are incarcerated, and you can't reduce the internal membrane. So how do we typically medically manage hemorrhoids? This is what you guys do in the office all the time. Add fiber in the diet to prevent constipation, try to prevent diarrhea, <clears throat> things like ammonia, fiber, questran, et cetera. Try to get their bowels more regular, not hard. Oftentimes we'll have to use Miralax if they're badly constipated. We want them to increase fluid consumption up to about six to eight glasses of water a day. We tell them not to ignore the urge to go. If they gotta go, go to the bathroom and get it over with. We tell them not to strain. We tell patients to limit time on the commode. We have some patients who will spend 30, 45 minutes on the commode, reading golf digest, etc. And uh, <clears throat> gotta get them off of their feet for two minutes. Um, we also want to minimize the use of steroids. It's really easy to put people on the Indusol, HC, uh, therapy for months and months and months, and prolonged steroids really makes hemorrhoids worse. So what are the indications for banding? One, recurrent amount of severe disease, itching, bleeding, prolapse, grades one through three, mainly are the ones you want to band. And patients with external symptoms, <coughs> a good indication for hemorrhoid and, uh, banding, and also folks with mild incontinence can sometimes benefit from hemorrhoid banding. Okay, so a little history of the, the, band, the uh, rubber, uh, band ligation of hemorrhoids. First in 1954, surgical doctor Blaise Dell uh, was the first report of hemorrhoid ligation using sutures. Uh, in 1963, Dr. Barron reported on 150 patients getting banded <coughs> excuse me, in office. And um, uh, this was with uh, steel instruments, not disposable. Then there was a breakthrough in 1999 of Dr. O'Regan developed a disposable suction rubber band ligator. And in 05 and 010, two very big sentinel reports came out on this procedure. <coughs> Dr. Cleeter did them both and reported on 5,400 bandings with a 99% efficacy rate, 0.3 complication rate and only a 5% uh, two-year um, recurrence. In 2010, he did a follow-up study looking at 20,000 bandings, found the same efficacy of 99%, and in three and a half years, there was only a 13% recurrence. So reviewing the literature, um, it's regarding banding. It appears that banding normalizes the, cell, the size of hemorrhoidal cushions, it's shown safe and effective in about 300,000 bandings. Inflammation actually uh, causes a pexing of the mucosa of the underlying tissue. So the second major point is how does banding work? Well, banding causes inflammation of the mucosa. It extends back to the submucosa and the muscularis. And that sort of anchors the tissue of the internal hemorrhoid up to the wall so it doesn't prolapse down so you don't have any more problems with the hemorrhoids. And the last point 
regarding ligation is that external disease often improves um, uh, with internal hemorrhoid banding. So here's just a quick photo review of what the banding is. This is an enoscope. So we start off and take a quick look at the anal canal of the enoscope. And this is the bander. You'll see how easy this is. Um, we put the banding uh, instrument up inside the anal canal, pull the hemorrhoid tissue up inside the bander, then deploy the band by pulling back on this um, trigger. It's completely painless, just it's above the dead paint line. And this is endoscopically what the process looks like. Here's the rubber band right after the banding on the tissue. Then, this is about an hour later, there's some tissue ischemia going on with the band. This is several days later, there's tissue sloughing. And then this is, <clears throat> this is one to two weeks later, you have these tiny little ulcerations with lots of inflammation going back. And this is how the tissue gets sort of fixed to the wall. And this is the end result after three bands occurred, you see this little scar tissue where the internal hemorrhoids are sort of uh, tightened up and they're not prolapsing and they're not causing any problems. So it's safe. Um, major bleeding only occurs about 0.3% of the time of banding. Um, significant pain only occurs about one to two out of a thousand with rubber band ligation. And um, how do, you, how do you get a patient to do this one? They do not need laxatives. They do not need a prep to have a banding. They do not need enemas. They do not need prophylactic antibiotics unless they're neutropenic. You want to stop the anticoagulants five days before the procedure. And um, generally what the protocol is, is you do one channel of hemorrhoids per session. And you do a, a session every two weeks. You do a total of three sessions. Tell people no vigorous exercise the day of banding, but otherwise normal activities. So you can go right back to work. We have a lot of people that leave, go straight to work, not a big deal. What are the contraindications to this? Anticoagulants are contraindication. Uh, portal hypertension with um, with uh, rectal varices is a contraindication. Pregnancy is a contraindication, and. Um, Active proctitis, either from Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, or radiation is a contraindication. When would you send your patient to the surgeon for a hemorrhoidectomy? Well, if banding totally fails and they're still very symptomatic, and also if they have some large grade four internal hemorrhoids, they're not amenable uh, to banding. So the take-home points, and then I'm going to move on, move on to the next lecture. Practical points are one, most doctors prefer not to deal with hemorrhoid issues. Two, uh, Dr. Hoppy and I are fully trained in the CRH now with Dr. Callow. We've done over 40 patients. Dr. Callow, Grace, and Ruth are going to be trained in this in September. So we're sort of revving this up as a part of our practice. Um, CRH is covered by nearly all local insurers, including the medical assistance managed care plans. Uh, we also do hemorrhoid ablation with ultroid and infrared, but we feel the CRH banding is far superior in most cases. Uh, the bands we do every two to three weeks for three sessions, painless, quick, no prep, no anesthesia, and patients can return to work immediately. So that's it for my talk. I don't know if I made it in the 10 minutes, but I think it was probably close. Okay, so like I said, when we're done, I'll be off to the side if anybody has any questions. So the next lecture is going to be uh, Francesca Calabrese. I want to give you a little bit about Francesca. Uh, Francesca grew up in Uniontown. She's the daughter of Dr. Chuck and Sally Calabrese. Um, she has her BS in dietetics and her master's of science in nutrition from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, and she's a registered dietitian. She joined our practice part-time in January, uh, full-time in May, and um, she's been very busy doing outpatient consults for dietary uh, measures such as treating people uh, with diabetes, gastroparesis, celiac screw, lactose intolerance in our office. But she also directs an exciting new program that we have in our office for medical weight loss entirely based on diet, which is called Ideal Protein. And that's what she's going to talk to us about today. So Francesco, thank you very much. Little, little, little 
bit of carbohydrates, this is an ideal protein diet. This is what our dieters do, what they eat. First off, I need to apologize. I am Italian, so I tend to get very excited and talk fast. And I only have 10 minutes, but I'll get right? So, ideal protein, this is the new addition to our nutrition center. I am the coach, nutritionist, dietitian for I work one-on-one -on -one with all the dieters. It's no secret, obesity is a huge epidemic right now. Nearly 70% of Americans are overweight. So what do we do? We get them on the ideal protein diet, right? <laughs> so here are some uses that the healthcare providers, why would you even put them on the ideal protein diet? First, metabolic syndrome. This diet is perfect for blood pressure, diabetes, PCOS, high uric acid, fatty liver, which we see all the time in our practice. And now we have the BMI initiative as well that we need to take care of. This program will help all of your patients get all of these conditions under control. So how does this diet work exactly? We are not telling you to eat less and exercise more. Because guess what? If that worked, there wouldn't be an issue, right? No issue whatsoever. So how the ideal protein works? It is a reduced calorie diet. They're eating only about 900 calories a day. Right? And most people do. Most people do. This is carbohydrate restricted. They only eat carbs from selected vegetables and from our ideal protein products. This is an adequate protein diet. This is not a high protein diet. We want to preserve the muscle mass during the weight loss process. This is partial meal replacement, partially my ideal protein foods, and partially grocery store foods. We put our diets in the nutritional ketogenic state. They are in fat burning mode. So a typical day on this diet, our dieters are eating four times a week. The key to this diet is eating. Somebody asked me earlier, what's the key? Eating, 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 eating. You are eating four dieters, they're eating four times a day. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a snack. Breakfast, lunch, and a snack are ideal protein foods. At lunchtime, they are eating two cups of vegetables. At dinner time, they are bringing their own eight ounce protein meat to the table, along with two cups of select vegetables. And as you see, we incorporate two green salads, olive oil, basically any plant-based oils, and we have them on the supplements because, as I said, this is a restrictive diet. So they aren't eating fruit, they aren't eating carbohydrates, no nuts, basically vegetables and protein in my foods. We work on the volumetric principle. We fill them up with high nutrient dense foods with low calories. Energy deficient, this is what I'm talking about, behavioral intervention. This is what makes us different than Weight Watchers, the Nutrisystem, the 17 day diet. I'm sure all of you tried that too, because everybody has. This is what makes us different. We teach them how to eat. We help them develop healthy, good relationships with food. That's what it's all about. I'm a bad relationship now. If it wasn't, they wouldn't be obese. Also, we have them blogging everything that they do. This helps me help them. They come and see me on a weekly basis, and I hold them accountable for their actions. They have to face me out of eye and tell me what they ate as in brownies sometimes it happens. I hold them accountable. Some people like to say that when they enter my office, they feel like they have to confess their sins to me. <laughs> true statement, right? <laughs> but this is, this, keeping them accountable keeps them on the protocol. This is why they like it. They're not sitting in a group in front of 10 other people saying, my name's Francesca and I ate a brownie. <laughs> That's not what it's about. Not what it's about. We develop personal relationships. So the modern day epidemic, hyperinsulinemia. Another another thing that sets us apart from Nutrisystem and Weight Watchers is 
we get to the core issue of obesity. This exaggerated amount of insulin that is flowing through our bodies, insulin is responsible for lipogenesis. What we do is we decrease the pancreas function, or less, we are resting the pancreas. So we're decreasing insulin and increasing glucagon levels, which is responsible for lipolysis. That's why we put them in fat burning mode. So, decreasing insulin, increasing glucagon. Capiche? <laughs> this, this is a graph that just, just shows how not only are these divers losing weight, but their blood values are decreasing. They're getting off their blood pressure medication. Their diabetes are controlled now, getting off metformin and the list of medications that they are on. That is the beauty of this diet. That is what makes me happy, is when my divers come in and say, I just got off my blood pressure medication. To me, that's a very, very rewarding. Another aspect of our diet is that our divers have access to a diet portal where they can get recipes, they can look at blogs, they get videos every single morning from our doctor, Wilkinson. This is our starter kit. The initial fee for the ideal protein is $325. With this $325, they get a, month, a week's worth of food, a month's worth of supplements, a beautiful marketing bag, a shaker. They also get unlimited access to me. When I need that, I need that. I'm talking to dieters 24 seven. I develop a relationship with these dieters that they probably have never had before on a health coach. I'm their number one supporter, I'm their motivator, I'm their cheerleader. I become their best friend. That makes us different than everybody else. They also get emails every morning. They, we also have our divers attend seminars, which is extremely important. This is what you can tell your patients. They can call our office, figure out, or they'll find out when our seminars are. They are monthly, we have them a couple times a month, and now we're starting to have them on Saturday so everybody can come. They are absolutely free. They are only about an hour long. We do a little short presentation, questions and answers, and we have them sample our foods. They're not obligated to do anything. I just encourage everybody to come and to listen, to see what it's all about. 99% of the time, they sign up. These are some before and after pictures. These are true. Yeah, Jenny Ann is a, one of our own up in the top. She lost 60 pounds in four months. Kathy on the left also lost 60 pounds in four months. This big mic, not big anymore, lost a hundred pounds in five months. Pretty incredible. This is it. This changes people's lives. And I'm here with them every step of the way. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Hospital in Pittsburgh. It is gastroenterology fellowship at UPMC, where he received extensive training in liver disease. He's married to his beautiful wife Diana, who's here tonight. And in August 1990, essentially 24 years ago today, he founded our practice. Of 
hepatitis C. It'll come down the pipeline in the last six to nine months. And new breakthroughs are coming in the pipeline in the next six to 12 months. So, Fred, thank you very much. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks for everybody for coming. So, a little bit of a shift in here. It's uh, pretty hard to talk about hepatitis C in 10 minutes, but I will try. Um, I actually had the opportunity to start in this when the treatment was almost uh, uh, futile with um, interferon three times a week, maybe a 5% chance of therapy, therapeutic success, which is eradicating the virus and curing the virus. And now we're upwards of 98 and probably going to be 100% in the near uh, future. Um, so a little bit about the epidemiology. It's probably close to 4 million people have this. Um, um, a, a big point that is being made nationally, I don't know if any of your EMR are dinging me for this, about screening all the, the baby boom generation, which is between 1945 and 1965 for hepatitis C. Uh, that's from the American Association of the Study of Liver Disease, and all of those groups of patients, which I am one of, um, should at one point in your life have a, um, a hepatitis C and a Sooner or later, that will be a quality measure from CMS without a doubt. Um, who, are, who are at risk? Uh, patients who also have a common HIV, patients who use intravenous drugs, but also patients who use intranasal uh, cocaine, hemophiliacs, patients who have transfusions, uh, tattoos with unsterilized instruments, and you can rarely be sure how somebody's tattooed, which is really fun because oftentimes they don't remember their tattoos, and um, uh, people who are incarcerated are also high risk for hepatitis C. Um, out of the 3.2 million that are thought to be out there, only about half know that they have it, only about a third have been ever referred for care, only about 10% have been treated, and only about 6% have been successfully treated, and they're pretty dismal numbers, and it's likely because our treatment was extremely difficult in the past, and that's really about to change in the next few months here. Um, the thing that's making a change are what are called direct acting viral agents. Before you remember, your patients were on interferon. Interferon modulated your immune system that has some antiviral properties, but the newer drugs actually act directly on the virus. That's the whole key. That's exactly the way HIV has been treated. It's, it's, they're not really working on your immune system, they're working on the virus itself. And so the first one of these came out is called Sofosbuvir. It's also known as Sovaldi. And it has been available for about four months now. And uh, we have patients on it. The current protocols still involve interferon with patients with genotype 1 and 4. Uh, genotypes 2 and 3 are now no interferon at all. Okay? Unfortunately, only about 20% of our population are genotypes 2 and 3. So we still need to give the genotypes 1 some interferon, but then and that's going to change in the next couple of months. Um, there is no upper limit on our age. So before we used to cut people off at 70, now for 75 and even 80, and we're in pretty good shape. We can treat them. Uh, no upper limit on BMI. Uh, uh, patients who have compensated cirrhosis are included, and that is really key because in the older treatments, if you had compensated cirrhosis, we could start to treat you and get you decompensation of liver failure death and the need for transplant. And that doesn't happen anymore with the newer drugs. Um, and uh, sub patients who are on uh, opioid replacement therapy are included. Um, currently, um, our wise medical assistance insurance carriers in Pennsylvania are not allowing anybody to be treated with these drugs if they are along that way. So, I'm surprised that hasn't made it into paper, but it's, it, I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so if you look at the um, historical treatments, we've got 60% of the patients were able to be treated. And now, with the current treatments, we're up with 96%. So it's incredible to think that we went with 5% in 1990 when I first started to treat people to what we're looking at now. Um, the difference in patients is with and without cirrhosis is becoming progressively narrower. Um, in treatment IU patients with uh, genotype 2, you're looking at 93, 97, 90. Um, in patients with, uh, without cirrhosis, with cirrhosis, you're seeing almost identical values. In fact, on this particular study, the patients with cirrhosis actually did a little bit better than the patients without cirrhosis. Genotype 3 is, again, remarkably high cure rates. Um, adverse reactions are the ones that come from interferon, which is fatigue, headache, nausea, insomnia, anemia. It still gives some rotten environment, which is hemolytic anemia, which 
management, dosage reductions, and really don't have to give patients uh, an epigen or growth stimulating factors in order to reduce the dose and there's no decrease in the uh, efficacy of the treatment. Um, if we look at uh, patients with discontinued therapy, almost all the ones with discontinued therapy are ones that had interferon based treatments with them. So the future is very bright if we can get the cost of these drugs to come down. Um, if they don't come down, the costs are astronomical. And, and right now, as I said, I, I've never seen any, and we've all been fighting insurance companies every day, I've never seen them dig their heels in as firmly as they have with this. It's really a problem. So it's effectively rationing. And um, there's third world considerations, and, and now all of the HIV drugs that, that we pay a fortune for are available for pennies. World and eventually this will happen with this too. So um, I think we're all gonna have to hang on a little bit until things uh, uh, come down in price, but uh, scientifically and medically we're really much more ahead than we've ever been before. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, our last speaker is Dr. Mark Coffey. Uh, Mark grew up in Wickley, Pennsylvania, uh, the son of a French horn player with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. Mark went to the medical school at Lake Erie College of Medicine, and his res residency uh, in internal medicine at Brook Army Hospital in San Antonio, Texas, and then his GI fellowship at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. He joined SWGI in 2009, and he's married to his beautiful wife, Christy, who's here with us tonight. And uh, I'm proud to and happy to announce that Mark and Christy are a new uh, father and uh, mommy uh, to a beautiful baby girl, Caitlin Marie, about two weeks ago. Mark is going to be speaking on the topic of uh, life-changing new therapy for fecal incontinence interesting. And 54% uh, of patients 
who have fecal incontinence have not even discussed their issue with any healthcare provider. One study suggested that 84% of patients belonging to primary care physicians, uh, the doctor didn't even know that the patient had the issue of fecal incontinence. Now when we talk about therapy, uh, conservative measures, we're all fairly familiar with some of these. Uh, we talk about, uh, again, we talk about uh, clothing barrier uh, type of products that surprisingly, when we started to uh, really try to identify a lot of these patients with fecal incontinence, I was really shocked at how many of these adult patients wear adult diapers uh, and were packed. Um, other conservative measures include uh, medications, loperamide, other uh, colonic uh, anti motility agents, uh, modium, physical therapy such as Kegel exercises may have some, some minimal uh, benefit. You can get the patients to do uh, those kind of things. You know, uh, biofeedback would also fall under physical therapy as well. Uh, you know, these patients actually learn how to control their, their valves uh, with um, stimulation uh, devices uh, that, are, that would monitor uh, actually their external anal uh, sphincter control uh, through uh, wires uh, connected to their, their pelvic area, perineal area, and sometimes in the anal canal. Um, and we, we do send patients to Pittsburgh for, for biofeedback. Uh, but again, there are insurance issues with that and patient compliance issues with that as well. Dietary modifications, avoiding trigger foods, uh, bulking agents, uh, fiber therapy, uh, methyl cellulose, etc. There are other uh, diagnostic things that we talk about, uh, which I don't have time to discuss in this, in this lecture, such as uh, rectal ultrasound and uh, a manometry of the rectum also. And this is, those, those modalities are very good to help identify patients with uh, sphincter defects, and surgery may also be an option for some patients, although that needs to be uh, you know, explored uh, intensely. But a new, a new therapy I'd like to talk to you about is called the Interstim uh, Fecal Incontinence Therapy. And um, when we talk about conservative measures, again, these measures um, often have very minimal benefit. And we see these patients back over time. And we stack these therapies. And often these patients are lost to follow up. So it's, it's a little bit frustrating in terms of measuring success with these conservative uh, modalities. And so I want to introduce you to a new concept of sacral neuromodulation. Some of you are very familiar with this concept uh, of focusing mild electrical impulses in nerves that control the pelvic floor muscles and sphincters. And by doing so, you can really control the symptoms of fecal incontinence. So this is the inner stem uh, device you're looking at right here. Uh, it's, it's similar to a, a cardiac pacemaker. It's made out of titanium. It has a, a lithium battery in it that lasts for three to five years. The device is placed in the, uh, in the buttocks area, in the, in the fat, and the, uh, the wires actually uh, are placed in the uh, S3 sacral sulci uh, and uh, stimulate the, uh, the whole pelvic floor very complex uh, mechanism. And the company that makes this device is Medtronic, uh, one of the biggest companies around uh, for neuromodulation, probably the world leader with neuromodulation, over 85,000 patients have received uh, therapy uh, in multiple different uh, areas of the body to include uh, you know, the neurologic uh, diseases and, and problems, to uh, back pain, to, to chronic spasticity, gastroparesis, and our neurologic colleagues are very familiar with this device that has been FDA approved since 1997 urinary incontinence. Uh, it works uh, very well for that. Uh, this device was uh, approved for about the last two years for fecal incontinence. Now when we look at efficacy, there are two uh, studies that, that have really looked at this initially. And when we look at uh, mean number of mean number of weekly incontinence episodes uh, per week before treatment, we're looking at 9.2 episodes a week, decreased to 1.9. Uh, episodes uh, per week per protocol after the uh, device was implanted. 
so here are the two studies, the Earth Swim study. And this is amazing data to me. Uh, we're talking about 41% to 47% of patients will receive a complete 100% reduction in fecal incontinence accidents in 12 months. That is truly amazing to me. 90% um, of patients will have some type of positive, positive response to this therapy. And 83% of patients will have greater than 50% reduction in their incontinence episodes on a weekly basis. And this, this other was a, this was a spin-off study uh, that looked at patients with rectal, uh, with uh, internal or external anal sphincter defects. Amazingly, 63% of these patients still responded to this therapy with a decrease of 50% reduction in comments on a weekly basis. 31% of patients reported uh, not using undergarment protection, which at baseline that was 3%. So you can see that this therapy, it really works. In terms of quality of life issues, all of their quality of life issues improved. And I can tell you, uh, seeing these patients back after uh, implantation, it is a game changer for them. Some of these patients are crying, they're hugging you, um, they're saying, you know, this is the first time in years I've been able to go shopping. This is the first time in years I haven't had to starve myself. 24 hours before going to my doctor. Um, so this, in terms of my 16 years of being a physician, this probably is one of the uh, most impressive, uh, meaningful uh, modalities that I've seen in terms of affecting the patient's quality of life. Now, we're gonna take a little look here at, uh, this is a test that I do in the office, peripheral nerve evaluation. And again, it's a, it's a five to seven day week test. You can see, you can see here the doctor is palpating the coccyx, the tip of the coccyx. What we do is we measure nine centimeters uh, cephalad, uh, two centimeters lateral, and another two centimeters uh, cephalad to find the sacral salsa. This procedure is done uh, under sterile uh, conditions. And uh, you can here, see here, this is a, uh, a grounding pad being placed on the foot. And we use lidocaine for local anesthesia above the sacrum. This is a three and a half inch finder needle being placed into the sacral sulci. The doctor is using a uh, what we call sewing needle technique. He's kind of marching up and down the, uh, the sacrum, uh, and he's going to eventually pop into the S3 sacral sulci. If you're good, you can get on first try. I'm, I'm, I get it most of the time. <laughs> first time. First time. So here he is hooking up a sterile wire to a narrow stimulator device. And the device has a nine volt battery uh, attached to it. And you're gonna see the doctor, whoop, let me back up here. Sorry about that. I've got quick fingers here. I bet you this thing's still playing too. Well, I can't advance it. Can we advance this, Christopher? Um, no. <laughs> but, uh, oh, it's in the show. Yeah. All right. That's well, all. anyway, so again, um, what's that? What's that? Yeah, I put this darn thing down. I'm killing myself with this thing. Um, but again, I want to point out that this is a test. This is a five to seven day test that we do in the office. And um, we put them in on a Monday, and we see them back on a Friday. And we have them keep a very, very strict bowel diary. So they have a pre-test bowel diary, and they have a post, uh, you know, or, or, uh, a bowel diary during the test. So again, here you can see the, uh, the needle being placed, and this is all in the sterile field. When we someone standing outside of the sterile field, usually it's the uh, it's the representative from Medtronic who helps me do these. And he's adjusting the neurostimulator. Um, so what we're looking for is we're looking for what's called the, uh, the buttocks bellows, if you will. So when the anal sphincter is tightened, you'll see the buttocks squeeze together. And you can see that, I'm afraid to touch this darn thing, um, right here. And that's what we're looking for, right here, the squeeze of the, of the bellows and buttocks together. We're also looking for plantar flexion, the great toe, and this means that we're in the S3 sacral salsa, just where we want to be. So here we are doing the other side. We do both sides. 
because sometimes there is lead migration during the test. And uh, these patients talk with electronic rep on a daily basis during this test. So if there's a problem, you can, you, you can move the lead to the other side. Here we're placing the, uh, the actual wire that's going through the finder needle. This wire rests right up against the S3 sacral plexus. And we know that it's in place because we have gotten the appropriate response from the, from the patient. And when, when, when the doctor's done, we'll pull out the, uh, the finer needles. The wires are coiled along the sacrum and along the sides of the hips, and they're connected to the narrow stimulator uh, module, which the patient wears for a week. And that can be adjusted. And again, it's, we're, these patients are followed very closely by a representative. Now, how do we determine if this is a, su a successful test? If there's been a greater than 50% reduction in symptoms from pre and post bowel diary, it's a success. And we will send these patients on to permanent implantation. Uh, and again, the patients, you kind of know if it works in these patients because they're, in a few patients, they beg me to keep this device in over the weekend so they can go shopping or do whatever they do because it's worked so well. So you'll notice if this thing works, uh, they'll tell you. Uh, and they want, immediate, uh, the permanent uh, implant uh, device placed immediately. So we try to arrange that the following week. It is placed by my, my neurologic colleagues at the hospital. Dr. Patel's put these in for me, Dr. Ryan, uh, and Dr. Smith. I've placed 17 of these uh, devices. We've done 17 of these tests. Uh, 15 patients had a very favorable response. 14 went on to permanent implantation. One patient uh, did not because they were a Medicaid patient. This procedure is covered by Medicare and almost all private insurance. It's not covered by Medicaid at the current time. Uh, but benefits are, it's a minimally invasive option that does not preclude the use of alternative treatments. It has a proven uh, safety uh, and efficacy record. And what's nice is this is a test that we do. So if it doesn't work, we can go back to conservative therapy and other options. Uh, if it works, of course, they would go on to permanent implementation. So uh, fecal incontinence is a very common uh, problem and definitely has significant uh, detrimental impacts to quality of life issues for these patients. Patients are often very embarrassed uh, to discuss uh, this issue. And so we really need to, to find these patients. And we've developed a very good algorithm in our clinic. We've trained our MAs to be very sensitive to questions to ask people to try to get some of these patients who've been kind of uh, you know, hiding in, 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 in the back, in the back uh, for years to, to come, come out. If conservative treatments are unsuccessful, uh, the interstim therapy may be a very viable option for those patients. So you know I was going to show you a picture for her hand too, and I, I hope she's doing this for our babysitter tonight because uh, we're a little worried about that. But um, any questions, I guess, for all the speakers, uh, or if you want to talk to me about this person, then please find me after the end. Good job with stuff back there, etc. And I want to thank our speakers and thank all of you guys for the summit. And have a great night.